Welcome to Pathway, we're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we wanna say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word give to our text number or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here. What does love take? You must have the ability to be without pride or arrogance, to recognize one's own flaws. As Jesus came near to us, one must get up close. You cannot love without giving something up for the other, your life. Love flourishes where understanding abounds, granting pardons for an offense even when it's undeserving. Love should move us, empower us, inspire us. So what does love take? Humility, sacrifice, forgiveness, action. Morning, everybody. Hey, I just want to thank all of you. We've we been in the series called Love Takes, and, you know, obviously love takes action as well, and this issue of sacrifice and just your willingness to give. And back a uh, little bit before Easter, we made the uh, announcement about Compassion International, wanting to build this church in Tanzania with Compassion. And then in January of next year is our 20th anniversary. And, uh, and so we're going to really encourage you to sponsor kids all around that particular church. So we were, we were asking for about $75,000 is all that it takes, believe it or not, to build a church in Tanzania. And, uh, and we asked you to step in above and beyond what your regular giving was, and you continue to give to what needed to happen here as a church, and you also gave to that. And as of today, about $108,000 has come in towards that build, so we can affirm that. And uh, part of me wanted to, I was kind of hoping we'd, get, we'd double the amount, actually, is what I was hoping for. And so, but if you want to continue to give, you can, because we're actually working with Compassion, and there are several churches right around in that region in Tanzania that are Compassion churches that actually need a little bit of help as well. And so we're going to use the kind of the, the surplus of those dollars to go towards those ministries as well and to help those churches out. So not only are we going to build one church in Tanzania, but we're going to actually kind of build up some other churches within that community, within that area as well. So that's going to be a pretty awesome thing to see what we're going to be able to do to really re begin to reach some kids and families with the gospel uh, through the work that you're doing right here in Fort Wayne. And as we talk about missions around here, we talk about in the here, which is right here, the near, right within the context of our city. We'll talk about that a little bit later this morning. And then also the far, and that is within our global ministries as well. And even globally, we've got some, some really interesting challenges that are there. And the Duprecies, who are in Cyprus, uh, Sarl and Cheryl. Cheryl suffered a very serious horse accident back about three weeks ago. Very fortunate to be alive. And uh, you can continue to pray for them as she's in her recovery for us as a, as a nation, we continue to be bombarded and we continue to become aware of all the brokenness within the context of our, of our world. Certainly what happened in Indianapolis this past week is something so devastating. What's going on as well throughout the rest of our country is a reminder that we live in a very broken world, don't we? We really do. And, uh, and yet these are, the, these are the intersections in which the gospel, the good news of Jesus, Jesus doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, Jesus going to that cross to redeem us. These are those intersecting moments where we have the opportunity actually to, to, to be the hope to the, to the world and to be the light in the midst of the darkness of what Christ has called us to do. So let's pray together. Father, grateful for your love for us, thankful for what you've done uh, through this body already, through the sacrifice of giving uh, and how we're able to continue doing what we've been doing over this past year as a church and, and yet also being able to reach into those ministries both locally 
and, uh, and those ministries that are near to us and those ministries that are far to us. For what's going to happen in Tanzania, we already pray that, Lord, you would begin to, uh, to be with that, that couple that is going to lead that church that will be built in that community and those kids that we are going to sponsor who will go back home and, and begin to understand what, who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about and what the gospel is. And we'll see little lives transformed, generational change, and families transformed as well. And I think about just the, 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 the challenges before us in our nation, that every day when we turn on the news, it seems like there's a, another story of brokenness, another story of darkness, and, and yet uh, opportunity comes in the midst of all that, to be Jesus in the midst of the brokenness, to be Jesus in the midst of, of what seems to be hopelessness and what seems to be darkness, and, and uh, yet we get the opportunity to do that. Lord, I pray for those families in Indianapolis that have been deeply impacted through, through this horrific tragedy down there. Pray for your comfort. Pray, Lord, for, uh, for your presence. Pray that they would sense that presence through the people, through the, those coming around them, those that are near to them, those that are far from them. And, uh, Lord, that more than anything, that you would use these moments as opportunities for us to, to convey really where the hope lies, and the hope lies with you and with you alone. And uh, so we ask for your healing touch in the midst of all that. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So every year... Uh, Oxford University does a little study, and they come up with the one word uh, of that year that was the most popular word of that year. So I'm going to ask you a question here as we get started this morning. In 2020, what was the one word? It was what? Pandemic. Okay. Anybody else want to think what the word was? What was? COVID-19. All right. Yeah. Anybody else? Another word? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. There was not one word. Actually, for the first time ever in this little study, there were 47 words that came out. There, was, there were so many words in 2020. We got bombarded with all of these words that, that frankly, just came to be. Pandemic, lockdown, flatten the curve, COVID-19, social distancing, and, uh, and then the list continues to go on and on and on and on. And really, when you think about it, 2020, it really was a reminder of just what kind of a frail world we live in. And the fact is that we do. We live in a frail, weak, and, and very dirty world. We live in a broken world. Again, what happened in Indianapolis is a great indication of this brokenness of this world in which we live in. We live in a contaminated world uh, with all the issues that are taking place because of COVID. I mean, we all have faced it. We're now facing the issue of what I call mask confusion, where you walk into, I walked into Lowe's this past week, and I walk in, and nobody's walking out with their mask, so I kept my mask off, kept my pocket, I walked in, everybody had their mask on, so I put my mask on, I'm walking through an aisle, a couple comes up, hey, Pastor Ron, they got their mask off, so I took my mask off, I said, I don't know what to do. <laughs> mask confusion is what I'm dealing with right now in the midst of all this, and and yet, you know, this has really been a reminder of just the fact that we do live in a contaminated world, and the truth is that the gospel the good news of Jesus, Jesus coming in to take our place and to pay that price that only he could pay for our sins, it really describes how God came into a contaminated world, a contaminated humanity, without a mask and without social distancing in order to provide a cure that could not be produced on its own or, on, or from anyone else other than Jesus himself. Think about it. God wrapped himself up in human flesh. And he touched humanity by dwelling among them and serving them. That, uh, that Jesus demonstrated that God is not afraid to touch what is dirty in order to make it clean. That he's not beyond caring for those who are weaker and less, ho less holy than he is. Instead, the gospel reveals that the love of God is best expressed in the context of when man is really at his worst. Matter of fact, Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And so not only are we to receive his love, but we're also commanded that we're also to certainly live out that love that we've received through Christ. Christ did it really three different ways. I, I thought of this this week, and, and that is that he touched the untouchable. We see that within the context of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That he loved the unlovable, those that that society had pushed aside, those that even the religious rule keepers of his day had pushed aside, and those that in many ways the law had pushed aside. We'll talk about that in a moment. He forgave the unforgivable. Those that thought I could never be forgiven, that God could never accept me, that God could never receive me. I've done something so awful and so bad. Why would God even extend his 
love to us. And yet, that's what Christ did for each and every one of us, and he calls us to do the same. In fact, John tells us in 1 John 3, 16 through 18, he tells us that, that this is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought, to, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. And if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And so sometimes it's our words, and sometimes it's simply our actions. It's how Jesus lived his life. It's what he called his disciples to do, to live not only your actions, but to live also with those words of truth as well. And, and we see that happen many times within the Gospels. There's one instance that I want to talk about this morning as it relates to this issue of, of love takes. We've talked about how, how love takes sacrifice, how love takes humility. Last week, Bay, how love takes forgiveness. This week, this week, I want to talk about how love takes touch or love takes getting up and close and personal with someone, I guess you could say, you can't do it from a distance. You've got to get up close and personal with it. And, and we fe- find this event, we've talked about this event before, out of Luke chapter 5. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to it, you can. Matthew records this. Mark records this event. Luke records this event. This actually happens early into the ministry of Jesus. Actually, right almost to the beginning of the, of the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus has called his disciples. He's beginning to kind of bring this ragtag group of people together is what he does. And, and in the midst of doing that, matter of fact, even on one occasion when he calls uh, his early disciples, uh, Peter, who, uh, who, is, who he calls in, uh, has a moment with Jesus where, where really, in essence, what, what Peter says in Luke chapter 5 at the beginning is that he sees Jesus. Jesus performs this miracle with this fish, all these fish they end up catching. And Peter actually makes a decision as he gets closer to Jesus. He tells Jesus, go away from me. I'm a sinner. You, you need to get at a distance from me. And and Jesus continues to move even closer to Peter in that moment as well. And, and so then he says to Peter and the rest of the guys, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And you're going to watch how I'm going to do that. And you're going to begin to emulate that and live that out within your lives. And so we have this moment that's a really telling moment, a powerful moment, when Jesus lives out what it looks like to really get close to someone <clears throat> who might feel a little uncomfortable to get close to. Might feel a little uncomfortable to get close to. It's in Luke 5, 12 through 14. Here's what it is. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Now, it's interesting because Luke, Luke gives us a little different description of this guy than Matthew does or that Mark does. And the reason for that, I believe this, is because Luke's a doctor. And he's giving us a description of this guy that, and the fact that it's not early stage leprosy, but this is late stage leprosy. Early stage is one day a little red speck, and somebody would see it and say, I think you got a problem there. And, and then eventually it begin to make its way over the body, and, and uh, it would begin to attack the nervous system, and it begin to attack the larynx. And, and eventually what would happen is this guy would have to be put outside the city into a colony of lepers. And so this guy should have been outside the city, and he hears about Jesus in the city, and so he starts making his way towards Jesus in the city, and it says, when he saw Jesus... He fell with his face to the ground, and he begged him. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand. He touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately, the leprosy, it left him in that moment. What's the idea for this morning? If you're new with this, I'll give you a big idea to get the message going. You have your outlines. You can write this in. That Jesus' touch really was an invitation into belonging. This guy did not feel like he belonged to anyone anymore, let alone God. And, and yet what Jesus does in this moment is it really is it's this invitation to belonging. This guy's grappling with this disease. And when you think about leprosy, leprosy really, it had several factors attached to it. It touched different, different parts of a human being, I guess you could say. Physically, certainly physically. Uh, you know, these, it was, everyone knew a guy had leprosy based on the outward expression of that. And and uh, then it attacks the nervous system, and it's, it wasn't uncommon for a leper to, to lose a limb or to lose fingers or, or, uh, or to have the disease begin to eat its way at, at, a, at a particular limb, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uncommon for even for them to end up getting close to a fire and get burned because they would lose the ability to feel these things. And so everybody saw a leper coming. They knew what a leper looked like. There was the emotional issues that attached that because now he's got to be outside the city into a county. Leviticus 14 talks about this, that he's considered to be unclean. And so the law 
The law that even was established was a law that was established to protect those around so they wouldn't be contaminated by it, but it placed them out in the city along with all these other lepers. And so emotionally, there's a detachment from their family and from their friends and even from being able to worship within the context of the temple. And so we have this spiritual component that then is attached to it. And, and typically with leprosy, I've done something wrong, you've done something wrong, there's a big sin in your life that has caused this to come on, and so then you're dealing with the spiritual implications of that as well. And then there's that just simply that relational piece that takes place. Phil Yancey made this statement, he says, though they may not hurt, leprosy patients suffer, surely suffer as much as any people I have ever known. Almost all the pain they feel comes from the outside, the pain of rejection imposed on them by the surrounding community. This guy felt rejected by his family. He felt rejected by his church community. He felt rejected by those in society. He was banished by those he loved. He was alone. He felt unloved. He felt without hope. And yet, what do we see in this moment with Jesus? Well, let me just tell you just a couple things that we see here. First of all is this, and that was that Jesus was willing to get close enough to be touched and to, to touch. He, he he shows us that, that, that really what he's saying to the, showing the disciples, and he's saying to all of us as well who are Christ's followers, who've, who've been impacted by, by the redeeming touch of Jesus Christ, that, that we have to become comfortable sometimes with the uncomfortable. And we don't like to be uncomfortable. <laughs> but, but he calls us at times to, to enter into some hard conversations that might be difficult to enter into, to come alongside of people that may be different than you are, that that, uh, that, that it may feel a little uncomfortable as a result of that. That as you begin to listen and learn uh, to those that, that may feel a little bit pushed aside and, and you begin to listen to those, it may feel a little uncomfortable. That God may call you into something that you're thinking to yourself, oh, that just doesn't feel really comfortable. Last night I was, I was driving home and uh, I had Bella with me, my, my 12-year-old now, and we adopted Bella from China when she was 10 months old. And and, uh, and those of you who have been around, you know that story. You know how, you know, I was, at the beginning, I was comfortable with it. I was like, yeah, let's do this. Let's adopt a little girl. Let's go after her. And then as it went on, I wasn't so comfortable with it. And, uh, and, and Laura, when she, was, uh, when she was around, she was alive at the time, you know, she would, she would just really challenge me. Oh, yeah, yeah, God's got, you know, we're just going to put God on the shelf. And okay, okay, okay. And, uh, and, and it really, it was not real comfortable. And then last night, we're, we're driving back after having some pizza. And uh, she asked these crazy questions about me. Hey, Dad, what time was I born? Like, I know that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what time you were born. We don't have any indication of what time you were born. Well, I've been told that maybe my birth date isn't even right, that sometimes they just make up a birth date. I said, no, I think we've got the birth date right. But, you know, and we get into this conversation about all this, and and we're talking about, again, it's just that just she's bringing up that moment of what happened back then and just my reminder to her of how much your birth mom really loved you and cared for you and made sure that she put you in a place where somebody would find you immediately and, and wrapped you really tight and all that goes with it. And, and, and there are times when I look at this 12-year-old and, and I look at what God has blessed us with and really blessed me with, and I'm thinking to myself, I am so thankful that God took me to a place of not being comfortable to stretch me a little bit. I'm thankful for that. And, and, and God does that to all of us, is that, that Jesus was willing, he was willing to be touched and willing to get close enough to be touched. I mean, and, and the fact is that nobody was comfortable with this situation but Jesus. No one was comfortable with this situation but Jesus. And this is how he touched. He touched through his presence, he touched through his willingness, and he touched through his hands. He touched through his presence that that everyone knew this guy had leprosy. They knew he was approaching. They could see him, and they could hear him. Typically, uh, what would happen with leprosy, it would attack the larynx. And, and a leper was instructed, if you're going to walk in the city, you have to yell unclean so everybody can get out of the way. And so, as he would have been walking through the city, it may have sounded like this, unclean, unclean. So they would have heard him. They would have seen him. Probably in the sense that leprosy actually emits an odor, they would have smelled him to the point where they would have tasted the smell. We've all been there. You, if you've been to Macy's and you've walked in by the perfume counter, you've all tasted, you've all tasted it. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. 
Uh, but the truth is, is that everyone would have recoiled, but Jesus stayed present. Everyone would have moved away, but Jesus moved towards. The presence of Jesus simply said, I'm approachable. It's okay. Let's figure it out. And then he touched through his willingness. The man comes to Jesus, comes down to his feet, gets at his feet. Jesus just stands there. Everybody else is moving away by this moment. And, and, and are you willing? Are you willing? Listen, just listen to it. Listen to it. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face to the ground. He begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. You can clear this thing up. You can make me whole again. And Jesus, he touched through his willingness. He said, I am willing, he says. Of course I'm willing, which he does for all of us. The cross was an indication of God's willingness to all of us. One writer put it this way, he said, For us today there are plenty of promises of God that he is willing to do for us. Christ is willing to reconcile us to God. Christ will never drive you away. Christ will make you useful. Christ will give you the Holy Spirit. Christ will confess you to the Father. Christ will bring you into heaven. Christ will show you his glory. And when this man says, you can make me clean, this is what he's saying. You can deliver me from the alienation from God. You can give me a place among God's people. You can save me from the body of of death. You can give me new strength to these wasting limbs. You can make me a new man. You can give me a new life. And that is, that is really what the gospel, the good news of Jesus is all about, is Jesus says, I've come to give you life and to give you life to the full, that it's new life here on this earth, that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. And it's also, it's also really solidifying that very fact that it's not hell, but it's heaven that now is my focus for eternity because of the work that Christ did for me upon the cross. So the question for us is this, are you willing to do for others what Jesus was willing to do for you. That's the call of the church. That's the call for every Christ follower that exists. What are you willing to do? How far are you willing to go? It's interesting because the great plagues of the second and third century, um, while, while most of the Romans evacuated Rome, actually Christians stayed to care for those who were sick. One historian put it this way, he said, all day long, some of them, Christians, tended to, tended to the dying and to the burial, countless numbers with no one to care for them. Others gathered together from all parts of the city, a multitude of those withered from famine and distributed bread to them all. They stayed in. They got in. They moved into what wasn't comfortable. And as Christ was present in the darkest of people's days, we, his followers, can make the most difference when we are present when others need us the most. I mean, that is the promise of the gospel, being willing to come along, alongside of someone who desperately needs Jesus in that moment. First John 3, 18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. And he touched with his hands. I, I wondered what this moment must have looked like. And this moment when everybody else is recoiled, everybody else is at a distance, this man is covered in the midst of his leprosy, And Jesus, understand this, Jesus could have done this from a distance. He could have said, stay back. But he gets up, he gets closer. And not only does he just simply touch the man, but I believe in that moment what we see with Jesus is we see Jesus realizing that this is a moment when this man for the first time, for the first time in years, is actually going to feel the touch of someone else. That in that moment, the nerves are going to be fixed. In that moment, the feeling is going to come back. In that moment, the emotions are going to be attended to. In that moment, physically, he's going to be be healed. In that moment, relationally, someone is going to come up and actually physically touch him who shows a touch of care. And in that moment, there's going to be a spiritual a spiritual healing that's going to take place too. I don't think Jesus just simply reached out and touched the guy. I think Jesus reached out and touched the guy and probably even hugged the guy. 
And the reason why we know the story is because I think Jesus stopped and said, tell me your story. Tell me, what, tell me about your life. Tell me what went on here. This guy needed a touch, and the disciples needed to see Jesus love this man the way he did. But let me give you the second. That is that Jesus saw people for who they were and were becoming. Oftentimes, we see people for who they are presently, what they have done in the past, instead of realizing, no, wait a minute, Jesus sees you for who you were, for who they were, and, and, and they were becoming. The cross confronts us with the reality of who we were, who we are, more or less, and yet who we are becoming. And, and that's really what Jesus calls us to do is to be willing to get ourselves at times in positions, situations that may not always feel comfortable, but, but also as a church to, to realize we're going to have a lot of people that are going to walk into this place as we continue to, to just be the people that Jesus has called us to be and to continue to be the people that Jesus has called us to be to see people come to know Jesus and to see people's lives radically changed through the good news of Jesus Christ, the reality that Jesus Christ came to give his life for each and every one of us and that our lives can be radically changed through the power of Jesus living out within our lives and within their lives as well, through the gospel, through the good news, through, through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. And sometimes what we need to hear is we need to hear stories of how that is being done. And so this morning, I want you to do me a favor and just welcome Tommy Carden. Uh, Tommy is with a ministry here in town called Redemption House. And uh, just welcome Tommy this morning, shall we? Good conversation. Hey, morning. So we've been, Redemption House is a very fascinating ministry because some of, for, some, for some of you would think, man, that doesn't feel really comfortable. But Tommy made a decision years ago to, uh, to kind of dive into things that aren't always comfortable. And Redemption House is one of those. What is Redemption House? Redemption House is a transitional ministry for women uh, that serves as an alternative to incarceration. So we have a network of homes that women can come and live in uh, court ordered residency at the beginning for up to six months and they can stay an additional six months and it is a Christ-centered home. It's a family and it works on addressing trauma, addressing addiction, lifestyle, um, upbringing, generational curses, challenges, setting goals, overcoming and instilling hope. Yeah, through through Christ. Through Christ. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm going to make an assumption and that is that when a woman is told by the judge she's going to Redemption House, she probably celebrates that fact. Uh, wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wrong. Uh, no, it's not always, uh, uh, more often than not, it's a really challenging adjustment. And we're, we're used to that. We, we anticipate that. I rarely get someone coming in the front door, skipping and happy and high-fiving us, Okay. But after that six months, when we get to that graduation point, that, that um, successful completion of the program, it is tears and hugs and thanks and love. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, it's an adjustment. Mm -hmm. And you do have to be willing to take some fire, mm -hmm. you know, some darts yeah. thrown at you, some stairs, some, some daggers, some choice words, right? Yeah. But we're meeting people where they are. Yeah. And I get it. Change is hard. Um, addressing your challenges are, it's hard. Yeah. It and is. being loved sometimes can be hard. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. Um, and so you guys really, you receive, you receive these ladies for really who they are, yeah. what they're coming out of, and, and just beginning to love them as Jesus would have you mm -hmm. love them. Yes. And realizing that life can really be radically changed as a result of that. The life that many of them are living when they arrive is not their best life. Um, many instances, many circumstances, many things that they have chosen or that were thrust upon them mm -hmm. um, led them to a place of brokenness and destruction and um, despair. Yeah. The opportunity to live at Redemption House to address those things that are not from God yeah. in, an, in a family that loves God. Yeah. I mean, the staff, myself, the volunteers, I mean, they are loved unconditionally. They are met where they are, 
and we see who they're becoming. Yeah, what a beautiful thing. Do you have a, a story? <laughs> I know you got a bunch of stories. I do have a bunch of stories. Yeah. I'll, tell, I'll tell the one I told last night All because right. it's, it's a good story. one. She yeah. may or may not be sitting behind me. I'm not saying names. <laughs> so a few years ago, a young lady was sent to us um, through the drug court program. Uh, she struggled uh, with an addiction and she, she told me when she came to the house that don't Google her name because uh, Wayne.com might have the video of her front door being busted down by the SWAT team. <laughs> she told me I didn't go looking for it. Her residency was not, she did not come in skipping and, and high-fiving us. She was challenging, very challenging. She was raised by a loving family, a faithful family, but addiction does not discriminate. And it took some time for her to trust us, to believe us that change needed to occur in her heart, in her mind, and in her behaviors. And then she embraced it, and she grew, and she succeeded, and she graduated, and she regained custody of her children, and she stayed involved with the program. And a year later, she joined our staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. She works with us today. She is also the president of our alumni network. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. She's pretty awesome. And like I said, she may or may not be back there. <laughs> so I don't, you know, I won't yeah. let you Google her name. Yeah. But she's a pretty incredible story. And she's an inspiration to the women there now. Yeah. Those yeah. are great stories. Yeah. I mean, those are I've got great. countless ones. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. You guys start out with one house. I you remember did. many, many years ago, mm -hmm. you know, we showed up there. Actually, I brought my girls into the you place did. one morning yeah. and they got a taste of of, of the environment, which mm -hmm. was pretty cool, actually. Yeah. I got that. a call from you um, yeah. out of the blue, which was really pretty cool because if the pastor of Pathway Church calls and says, hey, I'd like to bring my girls by for a tour, <laughs> you'd say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we met and, uh, and, and you brought a check, which is always really cool. Yeah. So, and got, gave you a tour. And um, next year, pastor, we celebrate our 10th anniversary. That's great. That's yeah. great. And you've gone from one house mm -hmm. to three homes yes. is what you've done. Yes, we opened a second transitional living home. Uh, so yeah. the one on Fairfield holds 16 women, court-ordered residency. We opened a second home on Wayne Street downtown in yeah. July of 2019 that holds another 16 court-ordered women. Wow. And just in January of this year, we opened our first graduate house. And that is a home that women who have graduated at any point through all of our years can apply for a room there, and they rent it. And they have, there are five of them there, communal living, structure, support, safety, connection, mm. and love. That's awesome. They're thriving. That's awesome. So we're looking at multiple graduate houses. Yeah. I think we hit, yeah. we're on to something yeah. there. I think about what Jesus says about the reality that you've got to care for those who need to be fed, care for those who need to be clothed, care for the prisoner. And that when you do that, you're doing, you're really oh, caring yeah. for the least of these. You're caring right. as I would have you care for them. And if you don't, there's trouble that's coming your way. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm so thankful that, that you do that, thankful that we get a chance to partner with you in that. And we do that through the food kitchen. We've mm -hmm. done that at times through some, when we have a surplus at the end of the year, we've been able to do mm -hmm. that as well. And we're looking for ways to partner with you right. even further. But even for our own people, what are just really quickly a couple ways that they can okay. potentially engage with you? So as we're talking and you feel, you know, the spirit, it, you know, unctioning you that you could do something here or you should be doing something here, there are so many ways to be involved. I would encourage you to visit us at the booth out um, after service. There's a booth. The girls, the ladies, the staff and the residents will be over there to answer questions. But some of the things that we love is when volunteers come in and they can join us. They can teach us, lead us, celebrate with us, fellowship with us. I'm sure people in here cook <laughs> and love to eat. So do we. So you can bring food and have a meal with us and play games. Or you can teach a crafting class or an exercise class. Or we can go on an outing. Wouldn't it be fun to take 20 of us to the movies and out to dinner? <laughs> I think it is. Uh, maybe bowling, uh, laser tag, you know, where we can shoot each other, but it's safe. You know, yeah. fun things. <laughs> Fellowship. Uh, normal <laughs> life. You know, you want to get dirty and have fun. Trampoline. I really want to take the girls to that trampoline place. And then I will videotape them and I will blackmail them. <laughs> It's but like, I love that. That's like adults on the slip and slide. It's not a good it's not, thing. It's to never do, a good me. idea. You're not as limber as you used to be. But it would be so me. fun. Yeah, I've done that. That's but there great. are so many ways. Obviously, the collections are super, super important. We couldn't survive without them. But yeah. your presence, what it is that you have inside of you, is what we need that love, 
that story, that overcoming. Um, just, just come and be with us. Yeah. Come to our home. Yeah, be the presence of Christ yeah. in the midst of all that. Yeah. She's going to be out at the table out in the, in the lobby area. Yes. And yeah. so you can stop by and see, meet some of the gals that are there. I think some of the ladies are mm-hmm. here this morning. And, and, uh, but also if you want to consider just signing up, saying maybe there's some ways that I might be able to engage. Maybe God's calling you out of a comfortable place into a place of going, this doesn't feel comfortable, but yeah. yet at the same time, it's this awesome. is an opportunity. Yeah. And it really is. Every time, every time yeah. I've been in that spot, I'm, yeah. I'm glad I did this. Yeah. yeah. So thank, thank you, you for your ministry. Thank you. Let's thank her, shall we? Good. So for those of you that feel like you have to fill in the blank, here's the last point, and, uh, and then we're done, and that is that Jesus did what he didn't have to do. This whole moment with Jesus is Jesus didn't have to get close. Jesus didn't have to reach out and touch. Jesus didn't have to say, I'm willing But Jesus did what he didn't have to do. And Jesus did for you what you could never do for yourself. It's the gospel. It's the fact that Jesus took my place. He took your place. Just listen to this. Jesus did not just die for you. He died instead of you. He suffered your curse so that you could inherit his righteousness. Galatians 3.13. He was clothed with shame so you could sit at the seat of honor. Hebrews 12.2. He was struck down so you could be lifted up, Isaiah 53, 3 through 4. The Father turned his face away from Jesus so that he could turn his face toward you, Matthew 27, 46. He lived the life you were supposed to live and died the death you were condemned to die so that you could have the reward that he deserved, eternal life in the very presence of God, Colossians 3, 4. He became poor so you could become rich. And that is the riches of eternity with him and with him alone because of the work that Christ did for you on the cross. He came, Emmanuel, God with us. He lived amongst those that he was with. He was present. He was touchable. He loved the unloving. He forgave the unforgivable. He died a death to pay the penalty for your sins for my sins that we could not pay on our own. The debt was paid, and paid in full. So thankful for that this morning, aren't you? I mean, aren't you? Yeah. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's stand. Let me pray with you. Father, I I know that for me, um, this, this reminder of a very familiar passage challenges me. It challenges me to be more present. It challenges me in the area of approachability. It challenges me in, in a sense of, of understanding what it means to, to live out the hope of the gospel to those around me. It's easy for me to sequester myself and to pull away rather than to be available. It's easy to, to take the comfortable rather than the uncomfortable. It's easy to to not speak truth. It's easy to not throw my hands open wide and saying, I'm willing, I'm willing. Lord, there may be some in this room this morning, there may be some marriages in this room this morning that they're at odds because another spouse has their arms closed tight and is just unwilling to open themselves up to that person. That there may be a husband here this morning that maybe he needs to move closer to his wife. There's a wife that may need to move closer to her husband. There may be some kids here this morning that just need to become more open to their parents. There may be some some friends here this morning that realize we need to reconcile and restore relationship. There may be some in this room this morning that feel as if because of what they have done, because of how they've lived, that God, you would never extend your grace and your forgiveness to them. And yet, Lord Jesus, you did that. You showed how far you're willing to go when you went to that cross. 
to pay that penalty for our sins. And that as John tells us, that if, we're, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just, and you'll forgive us and you'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, that Lord, you paid the price for our salvation. This morning, maybe in that group, maybe that group, if they're in that, that last group, there's just a willingness in their heart right now to realize there's a prompting going on. It's the very presence of the Spirit that really is convicting and saying, draw near. I will forgive you. Open your life up to me. And in the quietness of this moment, maybe the prayer they pray would just simply go like this, Lord Jesus. I need you. I need you to forgive me. I need you to lead my life. I need you to really save me. And I thank you for the work you did on that cross for my sins. And Lord, I believe that you went to that cross for me. You went to that tomb, that you rose again, and that, Lord, I need you, and I want you as my Lord and my Savior, my God and my King. And Lord, if anyone in this room prayed that prayer, your word tells us that all of heaven rejoices in that very fact. Matter of fact, with just kind of with every head bowed, no one really looking around, if you're here this morning, you say, man, Ron, that was my prayer this morning. That's the prayer that I needed to pray this morning to open up my life to the Lord's leadership in my life. I'd just like to affirm that in your life this morning. Just raise your hand and just let me see it for a moment. And I just want to thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Lord, I just thank you for that. I thank you for that moment of honesty and transparency. And your word tells us that when we do that, you begin to do an incredible new work in our life. That we become new creations in Christ Jesus. May that work continue. We love you. We celebrate that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's affirm those that did that this morning. It's awesome. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the give button on the web or the app or text the word give. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week and we'll see you soon.